Next on Unsolved Mysteries. A kind-hearted truck driver treats a young man to breakfast and becomes a key witness in a missing persons case. It's one of World War II's strangest mysteries. A Navy blimp crashes on a city street and there's no sign of the crew. Two Canadian high school sweethearts travel to Washington State for their first romantic getaway. But they never make it home. And a brutal serial killer murders at least eight women in New Orleans. Police need your help before he strikes again. Five compelling cases. I'm Dennis Farina, and this is Unsolved Mysteries. Join us, won't you? Memphis, Tennessee. 26-year-old John Cheek seemed destined for success. Fresh out of business school, he had been hired as the chief financial officer for one of Tennessee's largest real estate companies. Never in their wildest dreams did John Cheek's family and friends imagine that he would wind up the focus of an endless missing person search his face peering out from thousands of flyers plastered all over their hometown. By the age of 28, John had bought this house in East Memphis and was hard at work putting together the deal of a lifetime. For months, John had helped lay the groundwork to take his company public. He was working 18 hours a day and flying all over the world to meet with investors. Finally, the deal was on the verge of closing. Millions of dollars were on the line. The company was about to be thrust into the national spotlight, literally overnight. John was very proud of his accomplishment of getting this job, and he worked very hard, nonstop, almost, to see that his duties were fulfilled and that every I was dotted and every T was crossed. But one winter day, John didn't show up for work, and surprise quickly turned to concern at company headquarters. It was out of character, and then as the day went on, and then that night, uh, when no one had heard from John, we began to know that something terribly was wrong. Early the next morning, John's car was found abandoned on Interstate 55, where the highway crosses over the Mississippi River. It was about 12 miles from John's home. There was no signs of foul play on the car. The car was checked. Uh, everything appeared to be intact. The Cheek family examined the car also, and it appeared to be just the way John would have left it. Police theorized that John had committed suicide by jumping into the rapid waters of the Mississippi River. However, searchers of the river and its banks failed to locate his body. And to those who knew him best, suicide seemed to be out of the question. We didn't believe that he could be normal right up until 11 p.m. one night and then all of a sudden jump off the bridge the next day. We were just left with the same position we are right now, that it was just some big mystery had happened to him and we didn't know what. Two months passed with no leads, no word from John, and no reason to believe that he was even alive. Until a trucker named Ron Jackson rolled into town. Over the years, Ron had seen hundreds of missing persons flyers at truck stops all across the country. So he was stunned when he saw the face of someone that he actually recognized. The young man that he had met just the day before. 
You never really expect it to jump right out and say, hey, I know this person. I had breakfast with this person the other morning. So that was added to my surprise of seeing this poster. And this identity was so strong. And it just kind of grabbed a hold of me and shook me like this is the individual, period. You have breakfast yet? No, I have no money. Brown found the young drifter sleeping at a Virginia truck stop 700 miles from John Cheek's hometown. Oh, yes, it's morning. My first impression of this man when I saw him is that he was not homeless people. He was clean, and the white shirt was so white, it looked like it had just come out of the laundry. OK, help yourself. He didn't tell Ron his name, but the man did say that he had spent some time in an Arkansas homeless shelter. Sir, for a while. I didn't press him. He just was rambling on in the cafeteria line. So I would have to say that he was definitely not 100% in all mental capabilities. You have a good breakfast? Yeah. Where are you headed? Richmond. Richmond. Ron and the drifter were headed in opposite directions. Good luck. Outside the cafeteria, they said goodbye. Uh, well, there were several things about the encounter that made us feel optimistic that it was a positive identification for John. The first was the white shirt and tie, because that would be typical for him to be wearing that, because that's what he wore every day. He also mentioned the fact that he used very correct English and sounded like he was a well-educated person, which was obviously correct. For John's parents, the most promising detail was Ron's description of the young man's shoes, slip-on moccasins. John had a pair that was identical, and his parents believed that he might be wearing them. When we knew that John had a pair of shoes like this. We had not mentioned that to anyone up until this point in time. Immediately, my thought was, we've got to find him quick and get him home. He's uh, wandering around and not knowing who he is. No one could be sure why John vanished. His father believes that he suffered a sudden episode of stress-induced amnesia. It's sort of a self-preservation mechanism. If something in their past has become so stressful that they can't stand it any longer, then that's how they deal with it. They just block it all out, and you're no longer John Cheek, and you're no longer a financial officer, and you're no longer putting together a big deal. Since Ron Jackson's sighting, there has been no other sign of John Cheek. He has brown hair, blue eyes, and stands six feet tall. At the time of his disappearance, John weighed 150 pounds. There's a hole in my heart, and I'm hoping that all of this publicity will find someone that can uh, fill that void, and a mother never gives up. If you have any information that can help return John Cheek to his family and friends, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Next, two young lovers are murdered while on vacation. The killer then taunts the family with vicious letters. Our next story is about a young couple who had been dating for six months. Jay Cook and his high school sweetheart, Tanya Von Kylenborg, took the ferry from Victoria, Canada to Washington State to go camping. Jay was 20 years old, Tanya was 17, and they were in love. The couple's journey began in Victoria, where they took a late afternoon car ferry headed to Port Angeles, Washington. It was their first trip together, and they planned on a romantic getaway. Jay and Tanya had been going out for about six months, I think. I think she was quite special to them. They certainly seemed to be good for each other from everything that I could gather. Uh, I certainly had no apprehension about Tanya being with Jay. I, I felt very comfortable with that. But sometime during their journey, Jay and Tanya's peaceful vacation turned into a violent nightmare. Jay was driving his father's van. Witnesses reported seeing it drive off the ferry and heading south on Highway 101. 
Authorities believe they were headed towards a second car ferry from Bremerton to Seattle. It was just an overnight trip. Jay and Tanya were expected home the next day. If Tanya was late for anything, she would always phone. So when Tanya did not phone, the next evening when they were supposed to be returning, my wife became apprehensive. The following day when she didn't call, we knew there was something wrong. Tanya's body was found partially clothed. She had been uh, raped and murdered. We found some wire ties that you would bundle wires together with laying alongside the road. We assumed that they were used to secure Tanya in the van. Well, we didn't know what to think then because they hadn't found Jay. And for a while, it looked like Jay might even be a suspect. They told us to be prepared for that. Soon after, Jay's van was found 90 miles away in the city of Bellingham. There's one of the ties that was just like with Tanya down the scene. There's another one. Uh-oh, we got some blood over here, it looks like. Two blocks away, police found more plastic ties. The keys to Jay's van, Tanya's driver's license, and a half-empty box of ammunition. They also found a pair of surgical gloves. Together, these clues comprised an outright taunt. He leaves those behind as basically a sign to the police that you needn't look for fingerprints because I wore these gloves. And uh, he has confidence that there's nothing that's going to connect him with these crimes. A short time later, Jay's body was found. He had been beaten and strangled to death. His hands had been bound with some plastic tie wraps. And the things we found on Jay certainly raise a suspicion that the person or people who did this have been in the prison system before. Without telling you anything else, uh, that's definitely a possibility. Police believe that it's most likely that Jay and Tanya met their killer on the 10.20 p.m. ferry from Bremerton to Seattle. We don't know the killer's intentions when he first met these two. We feel that he was out to do some harm and certainly to uh, assault both Jay and Tanya. And from what we have found, I think we can say that uh, he had set his sights on Tanya and Jay was in the way. Lights. How you doing? Hi. Hey, what's up? Not much. You guys going to Seattle? Mm -hmm. Yeah. How about They're you? Friendly, young, on their first trip, and I think easily fooled. An easy mark. Say, I wonder if you could do me a favor. It's pretty cold out there. I only live a couple miles from the ferry deck. Can you give me a ride? I think it's safe to say that by the time they exited the ferry in downtown Seattle, they probably were in the company of the man that killed them. It would seem to me that it's logical that the person has committed crimes like this in the past and been successful at them. And having been successful, I would certainly say that it's likely that they'll continue to do them. Hi, Mr. Cook. How's the holidays? Great, thanks. Good. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Yep. Then, over the Christmas holidays, just four weeks after the murder of their children, Jay and Tanya's families each received a series of disturbing greeting cards. They were filled with taunting descriptions of the murders, and the author claimed to be the killer. Postmarked from New York, Los Angeles, and Seattle, all of these cards had been written by the same person. So far, at least six of these greeting cards have been mailed over three different holidays, and authorities still have no idea who sent them. Perhaps surprisingly, DNA found on the victim and DNA on the envelopes do not match. The handwriting in these letters and the cards is very distinctive. And there are some phrases that are very distinctive also. Hallelujah, bloody Jesus is a favorite phrase of his. He just continues to make life miserable for these parents who have lost their children. It's important that this individual be caught. Police are convinced the murderer is an ex-convict familiar with the Washington area. They hope that he may have talked about the crime and that someone watching might be able to identify him. Authorities are also interested in finding out 
who wrote the strange greeting cards. If anyone has any information that might help solve this case, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Coming up, the fateful flight of the ghost blimp whose crew vanished without a trace. Along the Pacific coast, the hunt is on for the Jap submarine that brought the war to U.S. soil. In 1942, the final outcome of World War II was still very much in doubt. The United States had every reason to fear that the Japanese would launch an all-out attack on the West Coast. There were known to be Japanese submarines operating off the coast. There had been an attack on uh, an oil refinery down in near Santa Monica. There was a great fear that there would be uh, more attacks. The Navy responded to the threat by putting together a fleet of 12 blimps to patrol the California coast. The mission of Airship Squadron 32, as they were called, was largely uneventful. Until August of 1942. That's when one of the blimps crashed on a city street with no one on board. It was almost impossible for him not to have been seen by somebody, but nobody saw him go, nobody saw him jump, and there's no relics of them at all. A real puzzle. It was perhaps one of the strangest events to happen here in the United States during World War II. Incredibly, Airship Squadron 32 only lost two men during the entire war. The two men who disappeared that day. Decades later, their exact fate remains a mystery. San Francisco, August 16th, 1942. It was early on a Sunday morning when Flight 101 prepared to take off. The pilots were 27-year-old Lieutenant Ernest DeWitt Cody and 34-year-old Ensign Charles Ellis Adams. Both were experienced and reliable, which made the events of the next five hours even more mysterious. Aviation machinist mate Riley Hill was supposed to go with Adams and Cody that morning. Adams had flown in the large dirigibles and was thoroughly checked out, but he had never flown in the small blimps. And this was an indoctrination flight for him that Sunday morning. Just before departure, Riley Hill was ordered off the blimp for some unknown reason. No need for you to go, Riley. Adams and I will take it. Yes, sir. Hill now believes that the heavy moisture in the air was weighing the blimp down making it unsafe to take off with three men on board. I got out, shut the door, and locked it. And they took off. The flight plan called for the blimp to leave Treasure Island, pass over the Golden Gate Bridge, then head to the Farallon Islands, 25 miles off the coast. From there, Flight 101 would continue north to Point Reyes, then south along the coastline. The first leg of the patrol went smoothly, but then an hour and a half after takeoff, Lieutenant Cody radioed squadron headquarters and said, Investigating suspicious oil slick. Stand by. Go 101. Those were the last words ever received from Flight 101. When it came time for further explanation, and we didn't get it, we just assumed, well, that was negative, and they went on their way. But when three hours passed and still no one had heard from the crew, flight commanders became alarmed. Frantic attempts to contact the blimp went unanswered. No, sir. No communications from the crew since the report at 742. I'm investigating suspicious oils. Yes, sir. Finally, a message was received, but it was not from Flight 101. Let's get a team over there right away. The blimp had somehow drifted eight miles off course and came ashore just south of San Francisco. 
there was a swimmer there, a man called Mr. Capovia, who was standing ready to go into the water, and all of a sudden he saw this huge gray mass just coming right at him. Now remember, this thing is uh, 47 feet wide, and it wasn't too high off the water. And he watched it come in, it dragged its wheel along the sand at the water's edge, then hit a little sand knoll. It bounced up into the air and then slid up a little bit of a canyon and then hit rather heavily on the side of the canyon and this knocked off a depth charge. The collapsing blimp was seen by hundreds of people. Bunny Gillespie was 16 years old at the time. I was on the way home from Sunday school and I saw this big gray thing coming in over what I thought was gonna be right over Templeton Avenue. When I saw this thing coming in through the sky, I was very surprised, as were a lot of other people, because things like that just didn't happen in Daly City. Flight 101 quickly lost altitude and headed straight for the homes in the hills of Daly City. One woman's house almost became the point of impact. It was a Mrs. Appleton. She said that all of a sudden, this huge behemoth had settled and scraped across the, the top of her roof, and she said it sounded like chains dragging. But the entire house was blacked out because of the, the size of this thing, and she raced to the front window, wondering, wondering what the world was going on, and she saw the rest of it, the gondola, hit the cross arm, break off part of the uh, uh, mechanism there and gradually settled down to the ground. I missed the actual landing of the thing, but when I got there, it was just like a great big gray monster with the gondola jutting up towards the tops of the houses. It was huge. Miraculously, no one was injured when the blimp landed in the middle of the street. Almost immediately, Daly City officials were on the scene. When Navy personnel arrived, they were shocked to discover that there was no sign of Lieutenant Cody or Ensign Adams. Apparently, the blimp had piloted itself straight into downtown. The legend of the ghost blimp was born. Investigators were puzzled by what they found. The door was latched open, a highly unusual in-flight position. The safety bar, normally used to block the doorway, was no longer in place and a microphone hooked to an outside loudspeaker dangled from the gondola. The ignition switches were still on. The uh, radio was still on and working. Nobody had touched my uh, fuel valves. They were set up just exactly the way that I'd left them. We still had another six hours of fuel. Lieutenant Cody's cap rested on the instrument panel, and two of three life jackets on board were missing, suggesting the crew had put them on before takeoff, as regulations required. A locked briefcase containing top secret codes was still in its place. It was as if Cody and Adams had opened the door and simply stepped out into thin air. The machine gun was still there. The expandable life uh, raft was there. Uh, and one more life jacket. There was nothing missing. The Navy investigation revealed that Flight 101 was seen by several ships and planes between 7 and 11 AM. Some of the eyewitnesses said they were close enough to see Cody and Adams in the gondola, and everything seemed normal. Theories emerged almost immediately about what happened to the two men. Some believe that Cody and Adams spotted an enemy submarine. When they descended to investigate, they were taken prisoner. According to one rumor, the pilots were involved in a lover's triangle with an unknown woman. Supposedly, one killed the other during the flight and then fled when the blimp crashed. Naval investigators came up with their own theory. They believe that one of the officers climbed out of the gondola to fix a mechanical problem and had some kind of trouble. The second pilot came to his aid, and then both men fell overboard. A year later, Lieutenant Ernest Cody and Ensign Charles Adams were officially declared dead. 
the blimp itself was repaired. After the war, it became this Goodyear blimp seen by millions at sporting events across the country. Few were aware that the airship circling overhead was the infamous ghost blimp. Coming up, there's someone in town who looks just like Jim Boomgarden. Could he have a twin? Imagine that there's someone who looks, walks, and talks just like you. Well, that's been a bizarre fact of life for Jim Baumgarten. Jim has been haunted for years by a mysterious double, a man who seems to be everywhere, or at least everywhere Jim is not. The place is Rockford, Illinois, and the event is a regular Saturday morning company softball game. Third baseman Rick Holder is coming up to bat when suddenly his brother-in-law, Jim Boomgarden, who should be 20 miles away at home, enters the game to pitch for the other team. Hey, Jim! Jim! I would say, hi, Jim. Hey, Jim. Hello, Jim. And I wasn't getting no response from the guy. So I just thought, you know, after the game was over, I'd go up and I'd talk to the guy. Hey, Jim! How's Cindy and the kids? He said the guy just kind of looked at him weird, gave him a funny look, and turned around and walked away from him. Five years later, and just a few miles away, Jim's father, Ernie, was leaving the doctor's office when he saw his son. Jim! My dad came after this guy and was yelling at him. Jim! This guy ignored him, got into a car, which he said was very similar to mine, drove off and didn't even acknowledge him. Now we had two people who knew me very well, and they were both fooled, especially my dad who reared me. This guy fooled my dad. He has to look almost identical to me. Jim had been adopted when he was an infant by a loving family in Illinois. His childhood was happy and uneventful, except for one strange incident. When Jim was 11 and visiting his adoptive grandparents, he was approached by a group of neighborhood boys. Billy! You talking to me? Yeah, do you want to play basketball with us? My name isn't Billy. What are you talking about? It's not Billy. My name is Jimmy. It's Billy. Look, if you don't call me by my right name, I won't play basketball with you. I couldn't understand if, why they want me to play basketball so much, and they wouldn't call me my, by my name, and why they were making this name up. I could not understand that. Jim didn't think much of it. After high school, he joined the Army, returned home, got married, and had two children. Jim says that many times, people that he didn't know seemed to know him. How's it going, man? I haven't seen you in a long time. What's going on? Not much. I'll see you around, okay? And I've met a lot of people, and there's no way that you can remember every face you see. So I kind of brushed off as, as nothing until some people would see me in places that I, I never was or I wasn't at that time. Finally, the strangest of all the encounters took place at a mini-mart just five blocks from Jim's home. Shirley Hurling was behind the cash register. Uh, pump number three. I was working, and this gentleman came in. I assumed it was Jim. No, not today. He looked like him. He walked the same, talked the same, same mannerisms. I assumed it was Jim. Within minutes, Jim and Cindy walk in. Do you forget something? No, why? Well, you were just here a few minutes ago. Oh, first time I've been here today. And I looked over at Cindy. I said, he's kidding, right? And she said, no, this is the first time he'd been out today. And I said, well, then, my God, there was somebody that came in looked just like you. If I'd been just 15 minutes earlier, just maybe, we could have ran into each other as he was coming out and I was going in and met face to face. 
The lady who was there said she saw a man who looked exactly like Jim in there not 15 minutes ago. She said he could have been Jim's twin. Three weeks later, Jim's wife, Cindy, was visiting his adoptive grandmother, Sophie. She became noticeably silent when Cindy told her about the odd case of mistaken identity at the Mini Mart. Sophie then revealed a family secret about Jim's adoption. Jim's father, Ernie, who had since passed away, told her that Jim had a twin brother. Jim had a twin? She said that Ernie didn't like keeping it a secret, but yet he figured that, you know, if Jim had never known his brother, that he would never miss him. I was excited. You know, all the speculations are now true. I am looking for a twin brother. Jim obtained a family history from the adoption agency and learned that his birth mother had a nephew who drowned at the age of 14. Desperate for the details, Jim spent hours in the library until he found the newspaper story about the tragedy. Finally, Jim had a family name, Hieronymus. Jim found a woman with that last name living just 20 miles away. May I help you? Is your last name Hieronymus? Uh, yes. I think we might be related. <sighs> you don't have to tell me we're related. You look exactly like my brother Bud. She was his aunt Come Myrtle, on. his birth mother's sister, the mother of the boy who had drowned. For the first time, Jim saw a picture of his mother, Hazel, and learned that she had died just three years earlier. Myrtle told Jim that his mother had cut herself off from the family and that they had never known anything about the birth of the twins. Hazel never told you about me and my brother? No, she never said anything about having had twin boys. Of course, I, I knew about the little girl she had. Little girl? Another bombshell. Not only did Jim have a twin brother, but he also had an older sister. Now the mystery's even harder. Now I got two to find instead of one, but I'm bound and determined I'm gonna find them one way or the other. Update. After we aired this story, Jim tried to access his adoption files. A sympathetic judge agreed to contact his sister's adoptive family and tell them of Jim's search. 47-year-old Judy Sullivan learned for the first time that she had a brother. Judy and Jim met the very next day. However, Jim died a little more than a year after their reunion. He had never met his twin brother. Jim's son, James, and Jim's sister, Judy, would still like to find Jim's twin or any other family relatives. Jim's twin brother, whose first name might be Billy, was born in the Salvation Army Hospital, Cook County, Illinois, on March 29, 1947. His brother was adopted by a family in Rochelle, Illinois. If you have any information about this case, please log on to our website at unsolved.com. Police in New Orleans hunt for a brutal serial killer. Their best lead is the woman that he left for dead. La Crescenta, California. We recently told you about Diane Hanlein. Since her mid-40s, Diane has battled a rare and often fatal blood disease. Diane needed a bone marrow transplant, and only one person was a potential donor, her younger sister, Marilyn. But Diane had no idea where to find her. Hi. Hi. Years before, when their parents separated, Marilyn went to live with their father. Diane stayed with their mother. Over the next few years, they saw each other just a few times. And then, for reasons long since forgotten, the sisters became estranged. I feel I'm asking a lot of my sister to do this bone marrow for me. 
But even if she doesn't agree to a transplant, if she doesn't say, I don't want to do this, I would still like to make peace with her. Update. When we aired Diane's story, a private investigator named Robin Lee was watching. Robin was touched by Diane's search and volunteered to help find Marilyn. I contacted the show, got a little more information, started out with the sister's name. Marilyn Jones was her maiden name, started with that and a date of birth, and went on from there. And it took me about three days to find her. Marilyn and Diane finally met face to face for the first time in 30 years. <laughs> it's so good to see you. <laughs> Once we hugged, it was like it hadn't been 30 years. It had been just a short time. I guess maybe that's why I feel comfortable is because I can feel the love. And when you feel that love, you feel comfortable. You haven't changed a bit. Oh, no, no. <laughs> I think I'm still in shock. You know, it's still like, I, you know, I'm not here yet. It's just, it's just a dream, you know, but it's, it's a great dream. And we have a lot of catching up to do, and we're going to have a lot of fun together. Enjoy the time we have. The day of the reunion just happened to be Diane's birthday, and Marilyn had not forgotten. This is the best gift I've ever had in my whole life, is to have my sister and to have my family for my birthday. It'll be the best birthday I've ever had in my whole life. <laughs> Marilyn hoped that she could be a bone marrow donor for her sister. But as it turned out, she was not a match. Sadly, a little more than a year after their reunion, Diane passed away. New Orleans, Louisiana. One summer day across the Mississippi River from the French Quarter, a lone recycler was collecting trash along a deserted road, often used illegally as a dump. He was about to set off one of the city's most complex murder investigations. The body was identified as 17-year-old Danielle Britton, who lived nearby with her mother. She had been strangled and possibly raped. Just 10 minutes into the investigation, Detective Elizabeth Wigginton's instincts told her that she was dealing with a serial killer. I don't know if it means anything or not. But about a man approached me regarding an attack of a woman, which had occurred approximately two weeks earlier. At this time, I realized that there was a possibility that this attack and the murder of Danielle Britton could be connected somehow, with one striking difference, that this victim uh, survived her attack. I assumed that I was dead in order to leave me there. The surviving victim, we'll call Brenda, had her voice permanently damaged in the strangulation attempt. Police believe that she was attacked by the same man who killed Danielle Britton. Brenda, I need for you to tell me as, in as detail as possible what happened that night. Brenda was able to clearly recall the attack in specific detail. I was at my house and I decided that I wanted to go and visit a friend of mine. So the man in the car got side by side with me as I was walking and asked me where I was going. And I kept on walking, and he kept on insisting that he could give me a ride to wherever I was going. And the car stopped, and before I knew it, the man grabbed me and put me into the car. Despite Brenda's protests, the man drove about a half a mile past her friend's house to the same deserted road where Danielle's body would be found two weeks later. What are you doing? <laughs> He got on top of me and began to choke me. He looked at me and I looked at him and I realized this man was trying to kill me. I tried to fight him off, but I really couldn't. I didn't have any strength. The killer strangled Brenda with his bare hands, stripped off her clothes, and dumped her body by the side of the road. Six hours later, Brenda woke up and found herself covered with garbage. 
Finding Brenda had certainly been a lucky break in this case. We had now a live victim who could identify an attacker who could be responsible for the murder of Danielle Britton. I knew this guy was out there stalking his victims. I had no idea it was going to get worse. About a month later, the killer attacked his third victim, Charlene Price. Her body was dumped within one mile of where Danielle was found. After another three months, a fourth victim was found in the same area. This is a sketch of that woman who is still unidentified. She was five feet, two inches tall, weighed 125 pounds, and had protruding front teeth. Only two and a half weeks passed before the killer struck again. The nude body of 29-year-old Lydia Madison was found in a different dump site. This one, only eight blocks from police headquarters. Detectives soon learned that three other bodies had been found in a nearby town, bringing the total number of victims to eight. These bodies closely resembled bodies found in our investigation in the previous months, leading me to believe that the same killer may be responsible for all these victims. The killer always strangled his victims and always left them nude face down in or near illegal dump sites. Seven of the eight women were found within a three mile radius. I'm still afraid because I still don't know where this man is. And I know he knows me just like as well as I know him. What's with me? It's more now like I'm living in fear every minute or every second of the day. On the night that she was murdered, Danielle Britton was seen with a man resembling Brenda's attacker outside a local bar. Police are convinced that he is the killer. The man was driving a blue late model Buick Regal or Monte Carlo. If you have any information about this case, please log on to our website at unsolved.com.